including soil fertility, pasture evaluation, perennial crop development. Uh, his present research includes the Clover for Bees project, uh, an assessment of Cerradella cultivars suited to be grown in the grass-based mixtures on the tablelands, and the new Hippo project evaluating high-performance pasture mixes for acidic soils across New South Wales. He has a wealth of experience evaluating pasture and crop species alone and in mixtures across many local environments. Richard presented his recent overcropping research, the practice of mixing crop species and low rates, low rate when establishing pastures at the previous pastures research update. He continues that theme this year, talking more broadly about relative merits of sowing pastures of mix mixtures or monocultures. Oh, you're there. Thanks, Jeff. You snuck up on me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Um, so thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the invitation uh, to speak at this event. Thanks to the Riverina LLS for putting it on. Uh, so, so the question of mixtures. So mixtures, of course, is growing multiple species in the in the same paddock. Uh, and of course, I've had a, a very long history in in or a very long interest in this space. Um, dating back to our own family farm where like many people from before when I can remember and to the present day we sow mixtures. Um, this is our family farm north of Goulburn where we sow our perennial grass based uh, pastures down to multiple species. So I'm always curious to know, you know what I should be sowing. And I've brought that interest to me here to university back in the days when I was studying at this fine institution. This is a, a photo of, of a mixture uh, from one of my earliest uh, experiments, my honours project. Uh, and I've sort of continued that theme on through my research and in my post-grad study where I was trying to manipulate mixtures by you know, confining different components to different drill rows. As Jeff mentioned, we did a lot of cover cropping work, um, looking at establishing pastures under cover crops. And of course, I also have an interest in um, perennial grains development. And this is, this is where, you know, the vision, the perennial vision is to be growing perennial grains in mixtures with legumes. So one way or another, I've spent a fair bit of the last three decades thinking about this topic. So what's the challenge? The, the challenge that I see is that when we think about mixtures, there's a lot of noise in this space. You know, there's a lot of talk about mixtures but it's, it's kind of hard to get information about it. And that's the moment of this talk is to try and sort of navigate our way through the noise. Um, from a t scientific perspective, um, we're, we're often trying to, to look at the literature and look at mechanisms and understand why, you know, um, mixtures function or species function the way that they do. But a lot of the, the plant ecology research actually comes from long-lived ecosystems, you know, like tropical rainforests. And as good as the river anna is, you're not farming in a tropical rainforest. So the point there is that, you know, whenever we look at the ecology literature and try and apply it to our farm, there's an amount of interpretation required. And this is where it can go a little bit awry. So when I sat down to, to create this presentation, I did what everyone does, and I, I got on the search engine and I just Googled, you know, pasture mixtures. And cyberspace is just full of stuff, OK? And so this is, this is a great example. So the only reason I'm picking on this paper is because it came up in the top 10 search when I, when I typed it into the search engine. So this is actually a, a, a study out of the Netherlands um, looking at pasture mixtures. Now, it's a great example. So, so the first thing is it's a credible source. You know, these guys, I don't know these guys in the Netherlands, but they're credible researchers. They've got a, a research portfolio. They publish a lot. It's a paper in the Journal of Experimental Botany. It's a credible sort of a journal, so that's fine. But th there's two things that strike me about, and this is an example of the type of things you see in cyberspace. The first thing is, if you read the abstract, the, the summary there, and don't, but if you did, you'd be forgiven for not understanding what it's about. Okay, so in this space, there's a lot of terminology, there's a lot of jargon, it's not very intuitive. You can read that, two times and still not really understand what they're talking about. And you get that a lot. And so I'm sympathetic to, to you know, the farmers in the room that are trying to make sense of it but have heaps of other stuff on because if it's your full-time job, you still struggle to understand it. The second thing is, even though it's a credible source, there's bits in it that are misleading. So if we just take the first sentence, for example, and what these guys say is that plant species mixtures improve productivity over monocultures, 
by exploiting species complementarities for resource capture in time and space. So there's a lot of big words there. That's the first thing. But, and, and really what they're saying is, you know, when you grow multiple species together, they're able to access more resources and so therefore improve overall productivity. But do they? I, th I think what they actually meant to say was that they can do this. But to suggest that this, this happens, that the, we always get this production benefit, no matter what environment we're in or no matter what species we're growing or no matter what our production system is, of course, is erroneous. It doesn't automatically happen. Uh, it can happen, but it doesn't automatically. So, so here's just an example, a little example of how even credible sources can be slightly misleading. And I wish scientists wouldn't do that sort of stuff. Here's another paper that I often quote. So this is a paper actually out of, out of Canada. So he, here's the first thing that you'll notice. So I've just quoted two papers and neither of them are from Australia. And you'll notice this. There's not a lot of literature in this space that comes from Australia. So a lot of what we're getting in cyberspace is from overseas. So keep that in the back of your mind. We'll come back to that. But this guy... Um, this is an older sort of paper, this is over 25 years old, which, which sort of highlights how long this issue's sort of been of interest. And he's just asking the question, okay, are mixtures more productive or are monocultures more productive? Okay, and what he did, he did a desktop review, he found 54 published studies and he said, okay, let's look at them. Um, how many studies, in how many studies are the mixtures more productive? And he found out of 54, there was 38 more productive. But in a number of them, the pure swords were more productive. And then in a smaller number, again, there was no difference in production. And so then what he did is he said, OK, let's average it over the whole lot of those studies. And we'll say, on average, mixtures are 12 to 13 per cent more productive uh, than, monoculture, uh, than yeah, monocultures, pure stands. And that's useful. And I've used that in my own work. But just think about that. As a farmer, how, how useful is that to you? Okay, so when you grow a mixture, do you just blindly hope that, that your paddock's going to be in that first bar, you know, where the mixtures are more productive than what it would have been as a pure sward? And how relevant is that 12 to 13 per cent? Can you say your mixture and can you assume that, that it's going to be 12 or 13 per cent more productive? Well, well, of course you can't, okay? So, and then there's other questions as well. So, how, how relevant? are these studies from overseas? You know, given that our, our species that we grow in our mixtures are, are very different, we've got a very different climate, you know, compared to the Netherlands or Canada. Uh, and our production system, of course, is very different as well. We need to know what drives our response. So if we're going to sow a pasture, we want to know uh, how... Are we, is it going to be more productive? How are we going to make it more productive? And to know that, we need to know what's driving that response. And therefore, we need to be able to make a decision, you know, when should I grow a mixture or when would I be better off not growing a mixture? To flip it around, and it's, it's useful to ask the other question. Well, what's the advantage of growing a pure sward? And in a word, I would say the advantage of a pure sward is simplicity, OK? Just think about the simplicity of sowing. You've only got one species to manage. Just getting the seed. Um, you know, there's, there's a picture of all these legume seeds that you could potentially get. You know, trying to find the appropriate sowing depth for, for seeds that are, that are vastly different sizes can be problematic. Um, getting the seed, procuring it, you know, preparing it, getting it ready for sowing, you know, it's all much simpler if it's just one species. We know that every species that you add to a mixture reduces your herbicide option. So if weed control is a primary example, you know, Less species is probably better for you. Uh, and then in all sorts of management aspects, that having a similar growth habit, similar vigour at establishment, similar grazing management and similar fertiliser requirements. So then, OK, so we know that growing a pure, pure sward, there's simplicity there, but what are the key reasons why we grow mixtures? And I'd say that probably one of the, the main reasons, which is understated, um, and certainly in the international literature, our mate in the Netherlands never even mentioned animal health. Uh, but it's animal health, managing ma animal health. And of course, there's a photo of Gordon Refshorgi. Gordon spoke at a, a previous, this event previously, uh, talking about growing um, the cereal with a legume to manage the metabolic disorders that grazing cereals can pose. Um, and I put that there. Um, so that was a reminder to me to flag the Australian context. So it's not to say that 
that the animal health consideration is exclusive to Australia, but I'd put it to you that it's probably more important in Australian production systems and sort of anywhere in the world. And the reason for that, well, there's two reasons. The first is our production systems. So there's no other industrialised sort of agricultural production system that integrates crop and livestock production the way that we do. So we're a little bit unique in that respect. And also our climate is unique. You know, so we've got relatively mild winters. We have livestock grazing year round, and that can contribute to the, to the animal health um, risks. And so if you consider, so we know the risks with, with grazing crops, but, and if you consider, consider our, our benchmark um, pasture species, lucerne, phalera, subclover, each of those pose considerable animal health risks, um, which in each case, the best management strategy is to, to provide a mixed ration. In other words, grow them in mixtures. Uh, so the animal health aspect, I think, is understated. The traditional reason for growing mixtures is to manage the nitrogen economy. Okay, so we often grow legumes to supply the nitrogen to drive production, but also, conversely, we want the non-legumes there to use up that nitrogen so that we can manage some of the off-site effects that excess nitrogen can have. So perhaps so accelerated soil acidification is one aspect. You could also argue that eutro eutrophication of groundwater is another. So managing the nitrogen is another important reason for growing mixtures. And then there can be species-specific reasons why we'd grow a mixture. So often with lucerne, if we grow lucerne alone, we often get lucerne and bare ground. Sometimes there's a good reason to find, if we could find a companion species that could persist with it as a bit of ground cover, that could be an advantage as well. So my recommendation is that the decision to plant mixtures is driven primarily by practical considerations. Okay, so it's you as a farmer balancing the need for simplicity with the ability to manage your animal health and your nitrogen economy, primarily. I'd argue that the pasture yield and persistence is a secondary, though still important, consideration. Okay, so it's not the primary reason. In, in increasing um, biomass production is not the primary reason why you grow mixtures. And we know that yield is context and environment dependent, and we know that the responses can go either way. Oh, that was the wrong button. And the, and the key point here is that just because you sow a lot of species does not mean that your pasture will be more productive. So now that we've made the decision that we're going to grow a mixture, okay, now it's time to consider, okay, how do we maximise the productivity of that mixture? Okay, and so to do that, we need to understand, well, what drives the production response? And to understand that, we need to understand a little bit about plant competition. Uh, so... Competition, when the, when the immediate supply of a single necessary factor falls below the combined demands of the plants, competition begins. That's an old definition and it's still true. And competition can be between species, it can be between plants of the same species, and it can even be between components of the same plant. So, you know, we're running out of water at the end of spring, the plant allocates its resources to the reproductive organs at the expense of the, the leaves, for example, okay? The key thing to note is that competition is dynamic, okay? So, and it's not only that the, that the supply of resources changes, but also the demands of the plants are changing. And so this makes it pretty tricky because there's a lot of moving parts and that's why there's often not always a, a, a very clear cut answer. We also should spend a little bit of time just considering species complementarity. So remember our mate in the Netherlands, he said that, you know, um, this is how it becomes more productive. We can get overperformance of mixtures relative to, to monocultures through this species complementarity. And there's really three mechanisms driving this. The first is biotic transfer. Okay, so, so an example of that might be nitrogen transfer. You've got a legume growing here and it's fixing nitrogen and you've got a non-legume growing quite close to it, it is possible for nitrogen to be transferred from the legume to the non-legume, okay? And sometimes that ha that's, that's facilitated by something like uh, fungal hyphae, you know? So, so picture a jumper lead where it's attached to the root of one plant and then it's attached to the root of the other and then you've got a conduit for the, for the nitrogen to run through. That's one mechanism why, by which this could happen. Another mechanism of, of species complementarity is resource partitioning. So species of different rooting depth, accessing different volumes of soil. 
different seasonal growth patterns, competition in avoidance. Consider the subclover plant that just avoids competition over summer because it exists as a seed. It's not trying to grow at all. So it's, it's not in the game until next autumn. And then there's also abiotic facilitation. So an example of that might be hydraulic lift where a deeper rooted species sort of draw moisture closer to the soil surface that other species could use. Facilitation is a, is a term that is worth understanding. So the definition of facilitation is species interactions that benefit at least one of the participant and cause no harm to, to neither. So an example of that is mineralisation. So picture subclover, it fixes nitrogen, it grows throughout the year, and then it senesces at the end of summer, at the end of spring, and then its, its residues just start to decompose. The minerals in those residues then become available to other species. Well, that's a good example of facilitation because it hasn't hurt the subclover to be, for, those, for those nutrients to be transferred to these other species because it doesn't need it anymore. It's senesced, okay? Uh, and another term that you might be familiar with is symbiosis. So this is, this is usually associated with the um, uh, legume fixing, sorry, the nitrogen fixing legumes. Uh, and it's a prolonged close association between organisms. So the, the root nodule bacteria, the rhizobia, form nodules on the legumes and that allows it to, to fix nitrogen. There's a bit of content in that slide, but there's a big clue there as to one of the driving factors behind uh, species complementarity, and that is time. You know, most of these processes take time. If you think about the mineralisation, if you think about the rooting depth, or the seasonal growth pattern. It doesn't happen the instant that you put the seed in the ground, okay? So it takes time to develop. And this was shown by one of my close colleagues, actually. So this is Tim Cruz. Tim's um, a, a, one of the, the, the key researchers in perennial crops research. He's based in Kansas in the USA. And he spent a lot of his career trying to understand nitrogen syn synchrony, you know, um, growing mixtures, particularly of perennial crops, uh, and, and growing legumes with them and trying to get the, the legumes fixed to match the, the nitrogen demand uh, of the perennial crop. Anyway, he did this study uh, in Kansas looking at this synchrony. And one of his interesting conclusions, which I think highlights the points, is that comparisons suggest net competitive interactions between intermediate wheatgrass and alfalfa, or lucerne, in the establishment year. So in early on, the components were competing, but that was followed by increasing degrees of facilitation over the next four years. So if we're going to expect these interactions to occur between components of the sward, we need time, okay? So another way to think about that, if you've only got your pasture in there for a short period, you're less likely to get many of these synergistic interactions happening, okay? Time's important. Okay, one last little bit of ecology jargon that I wanted to throw you away was dominance hierarchies because this is the other major uh, mechanism, I think, driving responses in plant communities. So this is, a, this is a great study. This one's out of the UK, again, not Australian. Um, and I found this very useful. So this guy, Grime, uh, when he was describing his, his, his ecosystems, he was grouping his plants into, into three groups. So, so they had the dominant species, um, which were the most productive species. We had the subordinate species, so these, are, these were not very productive, but they occupied niches. And then we had the transient species. So these were species that primarily existed uh, as juveniles and relied upon seedling regeneration. Uh, and in that study, this guy described a sort of a mass ratio theory. And, and I bring that up because I found that this theory was quite useful in explaining some of the results in my own work. And the theory goes that ecosystem functioning, and particularly in the short term, is largely controlled by dominant species, okay? So I just, to give you an example of, of, of how that helped me explain some of the, the results I had, I, I ran a whole number of cover cropping experiments. And so in these experiments, I was looking at cover crops and, and, and looking at, well, what's the effect if I separate the, the crops, so confine the crops to only half the drill rows compared to where I mix them together in drill rows? So very briefly, the types of experiments I ran, I'd had 
I had four crops, so I had barley, canola, lupin and wheat, so these were my cover crops. I had four row configurations, so I had the crop and pasture in alternate rows, so in, in the one-to-one -one configuration. I had the crop and pasture in mixed rows. I had the crop by itself, and then I had the pasture by itself. The pasture by itself doesn't uh, appear on this graph because this is grain yield and the, there was no grain yield out of the pasture-only treatment. I ran these experiments at three sites, so at Bogan Gate and Condoblin and Cowra, over two years. So I had a fairly large sort of a data set. The key point I wanted to make, so crops were undoubtedly the dominant species. They comprised half to two thirds of the biomass in year one, okay? And you, and you know that. When you've grown a cover crop, of course in year one, the crop is most of the biomass in that sward, okay? Yet, my average grain yields were on average 24% lower where, where the crops were constrained to only half the drill rows. So if you look along all of those graphs, you'll see that the, the dark bar, at the, the first bar in each panel, uh, is usually lower than the bar next to it. And that was true all the time, except for when it wasn't. And so this is the thing about competition experiment. You don't always get a consistent, there's always a reason, there's always an exception, okay? That happens, you just wear it. But overwhelmingly, across a fairly large data set, um, we got a fairly consistent result. And just, I'll just highlight this one because in the next slide I'm going to show you a photo of the barley at Bogan Gate in 2014 just to show you what it looked like. So this was just before harvest where we had the, the barley and the pasture in alternate drill rows uh, compared to where the barley and the pasture were in mixed rows. And of course there was a 20% reduction in grain yield and the reason for that primarily was because I'd constrained the dominant species. And you can see, you can see daylight between those rows. So I'd constrained its capacity to access sunlight, okay? So dominant species are important. Uh, and of course, this flowed on, again, a very extreme uh, example, this flowed on into the next year because after we'd harvested the crop, there's no crop left. So all we've got there is the loosen and subclover. And of course, you know, we've got uh, the wider row spacings essentially because we've got um, every second row is empty uh, in the first photo compared to where the loosen is sown in every drill row. And so in year two, we, we found a 20% reduction in the alternate drill rows compared to where species were sown in mixed rows. The key point here was that the, the constraining the production of the dominant species, whether it was the crop or the pasture, reduced overall production. Uh, and increasing the production of non-dominant species so, so those minor components of the swords, in order to improve our diversity, you know, if we improve the production of those non-dominant species, it had little effect on our overall production, okay? So, key messages. Mixtures, growing mixtures increase the complexity of management. There's no doubt about that, okay? The primary motivations, I would argue, to grow a mixture is for you, to manage your animal health and to manage your nitrogen economy, okay? So we know that once you've, made, once you've made the decision to grow your mixtures, then you think about, well, how do I inc increase the production of my mixture? Because we know that synergies between species take time to develop, uh, so there are fewer benefits in short-term phases, and we can have perverse effects on total yield. Uh, where management constrains the dominant species. So in my example, I constrain the dominant species by confining it to fewer drill rows. Other management that can constrain the dominant species could be sowing an inappropriate companion plant. So sowing a ryegrass, for example, that just muscles out those species that might have been more productive over the long term. So any management that constrains the most important species is something that you've got to keep a very close eye on. I've thrown a lot of terminology at you. Uh, hopefully some of it has made sense. If you take nothing else from my talk, um, I'll leave you with a parting thought. Uh, and, and so this, is, this actually comes um, from a study in the US, in the northeast of the US, and the, the recommendations that they give in that environment is the exact same recommendation that I would give in the Riverina. And in their words, Increasing forage yield and stability is best achieved by planting just two or three species that are well matched to, to the environment, rather than planting a, ra a random assemblage of forage species in a complex mixture. 
Okay, so if you're sowing a mixture, focus only on the species that you know are well adapted to your environment. Don't go and find any seed that you can find and just put it in and think that you're doing a great job. Thank you, Jeffrey. Very good. Great. Thank you, Richard. We might uh, thank Richard for um, his talk. Uh, Richard, we back up here after morning tea in our question panel. So. Um